Hi. This sequence of four videos started out as an introduction and survey of control systems for electronic design engineers, but has now grown a bit to hopefully be of use to a wider audience. It's a whistle-stop skim around the territory to set the scene, highlight issues and identify areas that may be of interest for further study. Mass results are stated to support the argument, but there are no detailed explanations or tricksy derivations. But the maths is useful because control is all about strategies, sums and algorithms to achieve remarkable things like building clever robots and self-driving cars, making energy and cost efficiencies in industrial production, automating homes and landing rockets like this, re-entry from space being a bit like trying to back perfectly at high speed into a tight parking bay from miles away while being buffeted from side to side and without the option to go forward a bit and try again, let alone the problems of trying to balance the thing from toppling over. Oh, and using the absolute minimum amount of fuel. This first part is a gentle look at the basics with some examples to illustrate the range of control systems and some of the objectives they're trying to meet, along with a quick tour around the bits of hardware that make up the system and the effects they have. Subsequent parts deal with some of the factors that govern system performance, the analysis techniques that can be used to understand it, and finally, the task of choosing an appropriate controller design strategy that might achieve the required performance for a given application. I think the quote means, don't let go of your deering wheel. Now the rockets, cars, robots, people, companies and other things you might want to control are systems. That is, they contain lots of interacting components rattling around in a complicated way in response to external inputs and internal pressures. While simple systems, like unfamiliar vehicles, can often be bashed around using trial and error, most are trickier, and it may not be at all obvious how they respond to any changes you might make to any of their accessible inputs, and some may indeed actively resist such changes. The general control problem is then to make a given system behave according to some ideal or acceptable performance under any prevailing constraints, typically those of restricted time and money. The system to be controlled may be planned or already constructed to meet a particular need, and the problem is then to build a suitable controller that can cope with its complexities. The input to the controller is the required system output behaviour we want to achieve. And at its output, the controller must drive the system control inputs to try to achieve this performance. The whole thing is then the control system that maintains the plant output behaviour according to the desired behaviour which forms the input. We might then want to embed the controller within the system so that the whole thing ticks along automatically coping with whatever demands, noise and disturbances the world throws at it. For example, our system G is a car, say, whose output Y, here its position on the road, can be changed by manipulating the control inputs U. And it's the job of the controller to do this successfully. Going along the road, the controller must overcome any disturbances which may throw the system off track. This is the so-called regulator or disturbance rejection problem. While it also has to manipulate the controls to follow some desired behaviour. This is sometimes known as the servo problem. The input to the controller and to the system as a whole is the desired output R. And the output of the controller, which forms the input to the system being controlled, is the drive or control signal U. The trick is then to choose a suitable controller to meet the overall system objectives. In this case, most probably a human driver looking at the output road situation and changing the input controls accordingly. This structure is similar to a room heating system in which the controller is a simple knob that regulates the heater output. The objective or desired output here is a comfortable room temperature, but setting the controller to medium, say, may not achieve this. Also, if someone opens the door and the room temperature drops, the heater on its own won't change its behaviour. It requires a human operator to track the output temperature and to make adjustments at the controller input to account for any misbehaviour of the system or changes in the environment. 
This control structure is a so-called open loop system because the controller at the system input has no knowledge of what's happening at the output. The signal path is one way, from input to output. For automatic operation, however, the controller must take over the job of the human operator and become aware of the actual value of the controlled output by introducing a path back from the output to close the loop. And hence, this type of closed loop or feedback structure. Here, the actual temperature of the room is measured by a thermometer and this value is fed back to the comparator, which subtracts it from the desired value to leave the error signal, the difference between the actual output and the desired value, so that the heater is directly controlled by the amount of temperature difference it has to make up. For example, assuming for simplicity that the hardware is linear and conveniently calibrated at 1 volt per degree for the input setting and thermometer, and the heater drive gives 1 kilowatt of output per volt, a desired temperature of 20 degrees, or 20 volts on the input, with an actual temperature of 18 degrees, measured as 18 volts, gives an error of 2 volts, and a heater output of 2 kilowatts, which will push the room temperature up towards the desired value. When it rises to 20 degrees, the error falls to zero and the heater turns off. Hence, the desired temperature set on the input is achieved, although in practice some small error will be required to drive the heater sufficiently to make up for losses. Now if the door is opened and the temperature falls to 16, say, then this will push the heater to increase its output to 4 kilowatts to try and restore the desired 20 degrees at the output. The system will not only operate autonomously, keeping the output at the desired value, but it will drive to compensate for any external disturbance that produces an error between the desired and the measured output. Even if the system itself becomes less efficient, for example if an element blows in the heater, any error will still try to restore the output as best it can. So the feedback error drive makes the system self-regulating to both internal and external disturbances. Hence, the advantages of feedback or closed-loop control are in its automatic maintenance of the output at the desired value and in its self-regulation to internal or external disturbances that interfere with that control. These advantages are so powerful that just about any system, natural or synthetic, of any complexity involves numerous feedback loops incorporating such sensors and controllers. As an example of how I might try to build a closed-loop control system, here is part of my unsuccessful patent application for an automatic blood pressure regulator. The crucial parts are some attainable objective, the input to the whole system. Here it's the desired blood pressure. Then the practical bits we need to meet that objective, in this case a sensor to find out if the current pressure is high or low, an actuator or means to change it in a useful way, in this case, the travelling crane theatre system, and finally, a viable strategy for achieving the objective. For example, if the measured blood pressure is too low, try providing some appropriately exciting entertainment. Or if it's too high, try immersion in a control lecture. I've noticed this can send the most excitable audience into coma. But as you may well have spotted, there are some possible snags in this strategy. So how does one go about building a successful control system to do this, or land a SpaceX rocket, say? We could try turning to a well-regarded textbook. This can be daunting, though, if it starts with a scary list of things to do, in this case making the point that many books just consider items 9 and 10, the controller design bit, and assume that the thing you're trying to control is well known and its behaviour accurately understood. In many practical applications, however, these are precisely the bits that are left out, and instead engineers would use a standard controller and follow steps 1, 4, 5, 7, 13 and 14 to choose one, and then tune it to get the best performance. However, steps 2 and 3, the getting to know the system bits, can be really important, particularly for the awkward cases that don't respond well to standard solutions on the basis that the better you understand what you're trying to control, the better chance you'll have to push it in the right direction. A good place to start might be step one. A look at some examples of the systems or plant we might wish to control 
and what we might want to achieve in doing so. And in our complex, interconnected and technological world, automatic control systems are finding applications from engineering through to ecology, finance, physiology and beyond. The objectives, including the saving of time and cost through the optimization of industrial processes, increasing productivity through automation and robotics, increasing transport safety and efficiency, and providing greater autonomy for the elderly and disabled. But one of the first recorded control systems was made purely for show. Hero of Alexandria designed it to magically open the temple doors on the arrival of the priests. For effect, perhaps, but worth paying for in return for status, donations and so on. Notice that it's an open loop system driven directly by the fire with no sensing of the control objective, the actual state of openness of the doors and impressiveness of the priests. So there is the added chance of the fire dying down and shutting out some unfortunate who could then be thrown on the fire to open the doors up again. Dull, dirty and dangerous activities are prime candidates for automation with the principal objective of reduced labour costs for coping with such unpleasantness. I like this inspection system using chickens trained to recognise substandard potatoes. They don't get bored, and unlike some complex camera inspection neural network schemes, costs a chicken feed and you get to keep the eggs, while slow learners can become burgers. There is currently a massive investment in automated aggression of all forms, while there is also a huge potential for the development of caring systems for traumatised and disabled survivors, as well as the expensively sick and elderly. Other objectives focus on overcoming the limits of human ability. Example applications include tracking the submicron wide dots on the video disc zipping past the reed head, moving the rudder of an airliner against 600 mile an hour winds, or accurately controlling the thickness of a fast moving hot steel sheet. Time and money are still behind most of this though. And here are some examples explicitly aimed at saving energy, time and effort. Alexa, stop doing that. Finally, in this quick whiz around, these are examples of attempts to automate interactions with the trickiest type of system, those that are deliberately trying by human or machine action to frustrate control. The specific objectives these systems try to meet and the requirements for success can be as varied as the applications in which they are embedded. It could be as simple as a more accurate control of the weight of soap powder in a packet, say, where a reduction in error from 5% to 1% would save 40 grams of powder per 1 kilo pack by reducing the need for overfilling. But they can also be indirect, like a high-level need to limit spacecraft weight might rattle down the requirements hierarchy as the limit to battery size, which in turn would limit computer power consumption, which then limits memory storage capacity, which ultimately might limit the amount of error checking in previously reliable control code. Unfortunately, along with an if it ain't broke don't fix it switch to a bigger rocket that could cause overflow in navigation data variables, crash both main and backup systems, and send diagnostic data to the flight control computer, and whoops, you have a billion dollar firework. Then there's human nature. Folk who recently bought a VW Golf might well be miffed about the emissions scandal, but perhaps not totally devastated, so they still go quite well and remain in the low tax bracket, at least in the UK. If the aim is to sell more cars, then it might be understandable that tweaking the energy management unit to meet both legislation and performance requirements may seem like a good, if morally wrong, idea. Identifying proper and attainable requirements is becoming increasingly important because it's essential for engineers to draw the correct high-level boundaries in our interconnected world. It's also practically relevant at a lower design level as they may be the input to some automated design package as is becoming more likely with theoretical developments in a somewhat similar way to how electronic design has changed with modern synthesis tools. Finally, Here's also the obvious point that it's better to choose the racing car if you want to win a Grand Prix race. So far, we've touched on the control objectives, but to complete stage one, we also need to think about the actual bits of plant. 
And one of the many snags with my blood pressure control scheme, for example, is the potential delay involved in arranging to winch the unfortunate system into a suitably downbeat lecture in the event of a high blood pressure crisis. So in this next section, we'll take another whistle-stop tour, this time with the various bits that go into making up a control system, along with some of the issues like speed of response that the bits bring with them. The most critical components are those in direct contact with the thing to be controlled. That is, the sensor to measure what's happening and the actuator to change what happens. Sensors are available to measure a wide range of simple process variables, such as temperature, say, as well as the so-called server mechanism type variables associated with motion. Advanced electronic fabrication techniques have brought an increasing trend for sensors with built-in circuitry to improve their performance, ease of use, and integration with digital communications and processors. Micro-machining techniques have enabled sensing elements such as accelerometers and diaphragms to be constructed on the same silicon as the processing circuits. This extends to more complex sensing systems in which the different devices may be integrated to improve performance, such as the fusion of GPS and inertial navigation components in mobile positioning systems. This slide lists some of the many issues and practical difficulties involved in the selection of sensors and in measurement essentially the process of assigning numbers or labels to physical qualities. For example, some things are easier to handle than others, and there are a range of measurement scales to suit, from simple naming like Pantone colour matching, through ordered lists like the Moore Hardness or Beaufort Wind Scales, and on to equal increment scales like those for temperature, and finally, well-behaved ratio scales like those for mass or length, where it's easy to find, say, twice as much as a given amount. It also requires some ingenuity in finding sensing systems that respond sufficiently well and quickly to more awkward qualities like the strength, taste or texture of a product. There again, there may be issues in getting sensors close enough to the controlled variable owing to exposure to extremes of temperature, vibration, corrosion and so on, such as finding the temperature inside a white-hot ingot of steel to see if it can be rolled out into plate without squidging over or breaking the rollers. Lastly, Back to time. While the accuracy of things like GPS position measurement improves with averaging over a period, a control system for landing a rocket, say, needs a continuous supply of accurate real-time data. The choice of a sensor must take into consideration the fact that they don't behave ideally. If our altimeter is zeroed at minus 100 feet, say, we might expect a bumpy landing. Parameters for choosing sensors include linearity, accuracy, reliability, range of operation, output and bandwidth, as well as speed. For example, this potentiometer may be attached to a motor shaft, say, to output a voltage measuring its angular position. In addition to offsets and accuracy, there will be a practical limit on the span or range which will define the limit of its operation. Inevitable non-linearities like this will lead to some conflict with any design based purely on linear theory. Also, and importantly, sensors are a likely source of noise, which may carry through the whole system to affect the controlled output. Actuators, with their associated amplification and power supplies, sit between the controller and the system. As the practical means, the motors, heaters, switches, pumps and so on, by which the controller can change the system response. These components are also liable to errors and non-linearities such as saturation, where a device like a valve or motor hits the end of its output range, say. Hysteresis, like backlashing gearing or electromagnetism, in which movement in one direction is different from the reverse direction. And dead zones, caused by factors like stiction in motors, which require a certain amount of push before anything starts to happen. Power losses and efficiency are important considerations for choosing an actuator. Changing behaviour, whether it's heating up a room, moving a robot or whatever, requires a transfer of energy. But since the instantaneous transfer of energy requires infinite power, actuators as power devices contribute significantly to system dynamics, resulting in time lags and bandwidth restrictions. Controllers run control strategies and drive actuators to implement them on the system. 
However, applications have a strong influence on all components of a control system, including controllers. And even though control theory is generic and largely regardless of application, it's the application that often governs the theory and devices used in practice. Folk in different environments have dug their own furrows in both design techniques and implementation hardware. For example, petrochemicals shun sparky electronics for a long while. I've even seen a working pneumatic analog computer, maybe not so good in a spacecraft, but safe and mostly fast enough for this application. Production lines used to employ clunky electromechanical relays programmed using ladder diagrams. And when semiconductor electronics was introduced, the devices were made to look and behave like them. Big money projects like aerospace took to time domain state space approaches early, moving towards robust systems while process people tended to stick with standard controller boxes and frequency response design, with a recent trend towards model predictive adaptive controllers. These control strategies have to fit both the controller and the control system it's pushing around. Very simple and well-behaved systems can be operated using trial and error, like driving an unfamiliar vehicle or dodgem cars. However, often things aren't quite so easy. In this case, it's important to have a model, that is, some understanding of how the system is likely to respond to its control inputs and environmental disturbances. This model will not generally include all of the available information about a system's behaviour, just sufficient for the development of an effective controller, which may entail simplifications like linearization, for example, to fit linear controller design schemes. There are many different ways to encapsulate such system knowledge, including physical models like those used in wind tunnels, graphical ones like maps and charts, and textual ones such as fuzzy logic rule bases. However, for control purposes, the manipulation and tool sets available for mathematical models in the form of differential and difference equations makes them favourite. Neural network models are useful for their automatic learning strategies, and while most strategies are implemented as computer code, program code also acts as a backup for awkward systems that can't easily be represented in other ways. After this very quick look at some of the fundamental features and components involved in controlling things, the next clip goes on to look at the issues surrounding the strategies that can be used to achieve the desired levels of system performance.